We'll go ahead and get started, y'all, if we will. Uh, welcome to the September 19th, 2022 meeting for the uh, for work discuss land development regulations workshop. Uh, at this time, I'd like to get Commissioner Fleming to do the invocation and the pledge, if y'all all stand. Let's pray, our Father, we come again in your name. We thank you for all your blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for a portion of life, health, and strength. We thank you for how you brought us, blessed us, you kept us. We pray that you bless this group that are here today. Bless these commissioners. Look over our staff. Look over the attorney. Look on every heart in this building. Father, we love you and we thank you. Help us to take care of our business as you see fit. Bless us one by one and name by name. Father, we ask these and all blessings in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I had asked for a workshop on these RV permits because, and I don't know if the rest of you, and it was just, just so we could all get together and put our heads together and get all the information together and see what direction we needed to go, if any, or change LDRs or regulations, whatever may be necessary to accomplish what we want to do. But uh, I just, I've had a lot of complaints lately about them and I've seen a lot of them myself with my own eyes. So I know it's an issue and, so that's for the reason for the workshop, just to discuss it. So at this time, I'll just turn it over to Mr. Harris. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I'm going to make some general comments, and then we'll try to get down into specifics on some of the existing, um, not only LDRs, but the existing approach to permitting some of these uses. Um, I think our LDRs are kind of deficient, to be honest with you, and I think you'll realize that when we... Uh, get more into the conversation on our current land development regulations. But in any event, our office has heard complaints. Um, I know some of you commissioners have heard complaints about, you know, some people build a nice site-built home and then uh, a year later somebody shows up with a camper next door and then before they know it they've got two more campers or two utility sheds and people are living out of them. In some cases they're being rented to others. Um, I had a phone call about a year ago. A gentleman was complaining. He had uh, moved to Swanee County, bought a property, was, uh, had pulled permits to build a house. And that's precisely what happened to him. When he started looking into it, uh, this issue of campers pulling up and people living in them next door, um, he discovered that there were some, uh, in his words, inconsistencies, he thought, in our land development regulations and allowing people to just live in travel trailers and RVs and campers. Um, he also brought to my attention at the time a number of uh, internet websites where people are now renting. Uh, not only do they own them and park them on properties, uh, but now they're renting them on some type of, I guess it's similar to Airbnb sites. So there's a lot of what I'll call commercial activity happening out here in these things as well. People are just parking these things and then renting them out. Um, I talked to Mr. Pravat about taking a look with me at our land development regulations. We asked Mr. Meeks to send us copies of what he was using, and then we obtained copies of the permits that are actually being issued today. Um, now, I want to make a distinction. There are at least two things that we are talking about here. One is temporary use of a travel trailer or RV uh, that's supposed to last for no longer than one year while someone is building a home or a structure. Um, you've got examples of those permits in there, and I think it says one year, or good for one year at the top of the permit. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, we're going to need to talk about this so-called recreational use that's supposed to occur for six months. People can obtain a permit and they're supposed to be able to park a recreational, uh, I'll call it a vehicle, a travel trailer or RV um, on a piece of property and use it for no more than six months. 
I think part of the problem is they're pulling a permit and never coming back to pull another permit. It's very difficult to police that. Um, I've spoken to uh, uh, Lynn. Lynn's here. She, she runs into this. Uh, Lynn touched and out there when she's dealing with other issues for the health department. But we've seen people, in some cases, put plastic drums in the ground and use them for septic tanks. In some cases, people are pulling permits and putting septic tanks in. Um, in other cases, like happened in uh, the chairman's district, um, people just open the cap on the side of a motorhome and just let everything flow right on the ground. And, and then if it gets too overbearing, they scratch a little ditch out and run it out to the county right away <laughs> um, and just let it go. So there are a number of combinations of things, uh, some of which are just uh, blatant violations. But um, there are just a number of things I think we're going to have to discuss. And I don't know if we can complete it today, but um, I'll just would like to turn it over to Mr. Bavad. We could go through, if you'd like to, um, the current practice. Um, unless you've got other questions or a different idea on how you want to approach this. Uh, Mr. Okay. Attorney. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like I said, we, I was just asked to, you know, take a look at this thing and from a from a legal standpoint, looking at what our current practices are and then, you know, trying to justify that or at least uh, you know, make it match up with what our current language is in the, um, you know, the LDRs. Basically, what I boil down to is kind of five different situations that Mr. Harris kind of talked about first there. One is just somebody just pulling an RV onto their property and start living in it. Uh, that's the first situation. The second one is you get a permit. Uh, you know, while you're building your home or something like that, and you get a permit issued there. And then the uh, home doesn't get built, and so you get to the third situation where they just start living in the home instead and keep moving forward there. And then fourthly, with looking at RV permits from a standpoint of just plain old, you know, the recreational permit that we have there, and whether you know things fit there, and then finally with those RV permits, all of a sudden the RV um, recreational permit is then becoming a commercial use uh, for uh, for the recreational. So that's kind of the the broad over overlook at it. But what I was trying to delve into is looking at you know what the language said, and then what we actually come up with. After speaking with Mr. Meeks briefly. We, we looked at uh, just two items uh, in the LDRs. One was you know, section 14.10.2, which talked about the one-year recreational permit, and the other is the LDR, which is 14.19.37, uh, which is the travel trailer requirements. Um, Basically, that's what we got down to, and looking at those were the two differing types of permits that we have and uh, as we move forward. Well, the first thing that struck me about all of it is that when you look at the definitions that are uh, contained within the permits, it's uh, more limited, I would say, than what, uh, what we've typically been doing here. I think everybody, when you say travel trailer, Everybody has a much broader view these days of what a travel trailer uh, really is. A uh, travel trailer, historically, if you go back to, I believe it was uh, 1959, whenever Winnebago was the first one to break off and then actually start uh, doing the homes that were travel trailers and motorized, and, you know, that type of thing. If you go through the history uh, of those kind of trailers, you'll see that they changed over the years until you get to 1973. And then 73 is when the state of Florida started recognizing that there was an actual difference between a mobile home and a motor home of some uh, type of description, because they were all called mobile homes up until that particular time because they could move, whether it was drug or driven. 
So then in 73, and then uh, they recognized that first, there was a lot of discussion going back and forth between 73 and 78, till they started getting down to actually refining what an, a recreational vehicle would be. Now, and since then, uh, recreational vehicles have been uh, redefined as uh, eight different categories, if you look in there. Um, and a uh, travel trailer and a uh, mobile home, or, or, excuse me, a motor home is only uh, two of those eight different categories. So from you know, a legalistic standpoint of mind, looking at it, uh, what is permitted, what's not permitted, because there is a specific definition that's in the statute that says there's only two things that are allowable, uh, those are the only two things that are allowable. If the statute makes a list and uh, then anything else is prohibited. If the statute had said something like uh, travel trailers, motor homes, and Anything that's similar to it, uses, you know, whatever, but our statute doesn't say that. It's so that you could expand and have different options looking at it. Um, you know, again, just looking at the language, we need to, what we've been practicing hasn't, doesn't quite fit that. Uh, again, my observations are just, you know, just those observations and explaining why there's a difference there. And again, when you look at, uh, and that's on the motorhome and uh, travel trailer part. I'm talking about just strictly the recreational permits. If you go back up to looking at the one-year permits where people were, you know, pulling it onto a property and being able to have the, the um, mobile home or travel trailer on their property uh, while they built the house, again, the only really mobile one that was in the definition there was, a, you know, was a travel trailer. Again, I'm just making the observation, uh, we're doing things, you know, permitting diff different types of vehicles. And that's what's key about all of this, I think, is, is that these things are vehicles. They're defined in the statutes as motor vehicles. They're not defined as, uh, you know, different types of structures. So, is more exclusive uh, and prohibitive because of that language that you look in there. There's a lot of, uh, what do you want to call it, inconsistency, I, I, you know, throughout our LDRs. And this is just one of the areas that, you know, needs to be initially addressed, you know, in here. Um, when you get to the one-year permits, you know, I want to be technical and say, okay, well, we can't let anybody have anything but a travel trailer and a mobile home in a one-year permit. It's very technical because that's what the technical definition says. But, you know, have we been doing it or not doing it? That's the question. And in addition to having some in other inconsistencies that in the LDRs, I noted as you go through Whenever you have in these particular areas, and especially in ag areas, and really especially in the ESA areas, there's limited things that you are allowed to do. Those things that, you know, are moving on to, and dealing with uh, recreational activities, the, if you refer to the section in there that I copied that's 4.5A7, it notes about special exceptions and special permits you know, that are allowable. But if you look at the types of things that they look at, they're talking about golf courses, country clubs, uh, ranges, racket clubs, travel trailer parks or campgrounds. They're grouping the uses for those recreational activities for these vehicles uh, in groups. So that seems to me that it's a little inconsistent with what we're doing. And then if you go into the ESA area, there's not even a, you know, an area that addresses any of this stuff in the ESA part of the, the LDRs. The LDRs there, they deal only with one exception, and it's a special exception that you have to go and get, and it's specifically for a campground of any type that has, uh, and it has 100 uh, campsites 
our camping spots, you know, period. So if you're going to be camping in that area, you need to come to y'all for a special permit. Again, looking at what it is, what our practice is, and, you know, how we move forward, I wasn't asked to make any you know, real recommendations looking at those things, but one thing that jumps out at me is the, the commercial versus non-commercial uh, use. These uh, permits, uh, or personal permits, uh, when you're looking at it, to be granted a special privilege, you know, to be able to, dump, to, be able to utilize it personally on the piece of property. I think anything, uh, anyone, or entity making uh, a commercial use of these uh, personal permits, uh, I think is, you know, in a violation right now. So I say that those things are out there. As Mr. Harris said, he's seen it, been called about it. Y'all have seen it, been called about it. And so I just wanted to just give you the technical background of where I think it is that, you know, if you want to permit the process, you know, to go forward, there are some, some things that we need to do. And that's why I put the items for discretion that's in your little packet right there for you to jump on to those types of things. And it was just as, as an outline to make you think about it so that y'all could discuss among yourselves how you wanted to move forward with it. But those were just ideas to make the conversation lively, as it were, as we go on. <laughs> That's it for the moment, Mr. Chairman, until I get asked some questions get or something. somebody starts throwing stuff at me. So when you say refined definition of a recreational vehicle, we need to get more specific as to what a recreational vehicle is. Yes, sir. We're issuing a recreational vehicle permit under Chapter 320. A recreational vehicle is a recreational vehicular unit. And they're composed of eight different categories. As it turns out, that a motorhome is one category and a travel trailer is one category. So there's a specific definition, and we have a specific definition in our um, you know, LDRs of what a travel trailer is. It doesn't include you know, a fifth wheel. It, 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 in, depending on which permit you're talking about, uh, it doesn't even um, include a motor home to be able to put it on to the piece of property and stay there for the one year while you build your home. So just using you know, the word travel trailer or motor home, I do not think is expansive enough to cover all, all of the circumstances that can occur and are occurring you know, at this particular point. So, De depending if you're going to continue the practice, you know, at all, we need to at least at a minimum change that definition so that it can be inclusive of all of those types of items. Tracking for better enforcement of one year. What do, what are you referring to? There? Okay, well, right there in, when you were doing permitting, you know, when you when you have all the the one year permits and the two year per, I mean the one year permit or the residential permit when it gets issued, you know, one of the things I was just saying on here, we need to have track tracking of wherever all those things are, uh, so that when a time expires, whenever the event uh, you know comes up, that. Uh, uh, staff can then go out there and have an avenue or at least know that they uh, need to be enforcing you know that one year to be, be able to get a renewal to you know or do whatever again from my from my aspect of it um, you know we want to keep track of it I mean that's a question are we keeping track of it okay if we are Great, but we need to have a, a good tracking system to make sure that we can have better enforcement of whatever y'all come up with. Mr. Meeks, does when they apply for that permit for the for the temporary the six month deal, does that is that prorated out? to start and stop at a certain time, not like all permits start in October or January or or do they just go 12 months from the time they're issued? 12 months from the time they're issued. Their limitation is six months occupancy in calendar year. So, I mean, you know, if, if, if you obtain the recreational vehicle permit in June, your calendar year is going to be June to June, you know. Um, 
So if you exceed that six-month occupancy within that allotted time frame, then it will be a violation. I think the permit, though, I think you asked about the permit. I think you issued the permit one time, though. Yeah, the permit's never been set up to expire. It, it, oh. it's, it's different. There is no, there's no expiration in a mobile home permit. There's no expiration in a residential permit. You, you issue, it's a conditional permit. So there are certain conditions that an individual has to meet. So I can't go get a recreational vehicle permit on Don's property. Ronald Peaks needs to own that property. I have an obligation that I have to show a primary residence elsewhere, and my occupancy is limited to six months in a calendar year. I then have to secure a permit, and I have to secure a septic permit. So the, the thing that, that keeps coming up that we've had a lot of discussion about is that most of these situations that come up where you do have these people with homemade septic tanks, they are not people who have obtained permits. They are the people who are in violation. So at the end of the day, it becomes an enforcement issue. So it's, it don't matter if we had 20 pages of recreational vehicle permit regulations, those same people are still gonna find a way to violate and it becomes the enforcement side of that. You know, so it's, it's those people who don't secure the septic permit like they need to, those are the, those are the people that are in violation. You know, uh, the one year temporary use permit, I mean, I think Mac had passed out some of that too. You know, we, we were just trying to get some realistic numbers of what we were dealing with. So we just went from 2020 to current. So I think we've got 39 one-year temporary use permits. Um, you know, most of the time when we have those one-year temporary use permits, they're, they're either issued for people who have um, started construction or are about to start construction or waiting on their, their manufactured home to be delivered to the property gives them an opportunity to make improvements on property. Uh, we do, it's not as, it's not, it's not issued as much, but it is issued in certain situations that we have people who sustain damage to their home, uh, whether it be like a limb falling through a roof that makes the structure not habitable, whether they've had fire damage, whether they've had flood damage or something like that, that it gives them an opportunity that you can get this temporary uh, permit in place to use it for at least one year until your improvements are made. Um, you know, I mean, the, uh, the issue of whether it's a travel trailer, whether it's a recreational vehicle, I mean, we, we do have language in there with travel trailer, we do have language in there with motor homes, uh, we do have certain sections of the LDRs that kind of define major recreational vehicle, um, what, what major recreational vehicles are. Um, our language regulations also uh, separate park models and park trailers. Okay, so by the statute, park models and park trailers also fall in these recreational vehicle categories. Um, however, they're not designed to be pulled up and down the highway like a conventional camper would be or a motorhome drift. They actually require a separate DOT permit to be moved, similar to like a mobile home. Uh, so the way our regulations are written is we specifically spell them out separately in our definitions of what a park trailer is and what a park trailer space is. So it limits these park models to be placed in approved RV parks and campgrounds. So generally finding them throughout the county, you don't have the park, the park model issue with those. Even though they are recreational vehicles, they don't fall under the same criteria. Um, you know, it's not where I can back my pickup truck to it and pull it away. You know, it, it requires a little bit more uh, situations to, to move that. but. You know, any of our recreational vehicles, we were going through some of our violations that Robin has been dealing with since he's been on board. And a lot of this, you know, that, that comes up, just kind of comes up to the years of lack of enforcement side that we had. Um, I, I, I mentioned to Robin that, you know, based on the things that I had to deal with just in my own job, that it probably took me two years to do what he's done in, in the few months that he's been here, you know. Um, with the cases that he's been working now, I think he had seven cases that he's closed out so far that dealt with recreational vehicles. He has 12 open permits that deal with recreational vehicles. We have a code enforcement hearing on Wednesday for one of those properties. So um, he has hit the ground running and you know he does have a good graft and he's actually implementing a good policy and procedure behind that so that it makes things easier the next go-round. Um, 
but you know, in, in reality, the, the violations that we've dealt with, that we have with recreational vehicles, has typically been individuals who have had a, a mobile home repossessed, that has had improvements on the property that's easily hooked up to after the mobile home's been uh, removed. Um, they have either uh, manipulated an electrical service that existed either at a residence or an accessory building or something on the property and put in an RV hookup without securing the necessary permits. That has been most of the time that we have. Um, and then usually once they have one RV site in place, it's easy to manipulate that electrical to add more than one, okay? So the way the regulations are under the recreational permit, we don't allow multiple of those. So if you, if you meet the criteria of securing that recreational permit, you're allowed one RV permit. Um, the, the RV is not for usage of other people, you know? So if we were looking at situations to try to uh, curb the rental of those in these Airbnb things, you could basically go back into that same section and include language that those RVs, these are these permitted RV sites cannot be treated as rental units or income producing property. And if they do so, it's back to an enforcement issue. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Trayers. Um, I don't disagree with what Mr. Meeks just said about an enforcement issue, but I think therein lies the problem. How do you enforce this six-month occupancy? Um, I think I'm thinking through just the practical side of that question. One, um, I, I'm thrilled that we've got a good list of what's been issued in the last couple of years, but I don't have any idea. Does anyone actually know how many? Does anyone actually know how many recreational use permits exist have been issued? for the last 10 years. How many of these uses are out there? From the enforcement side, and I was made aware of, I didn't know that this was going on with this Airbnb and this rental thing until I started getting some phone calls and some, because some other people wanted to do it. That's, that's, that's why I got some of the phone calls. Hey, I understand I can rent these things out. Um, can you send me the policy on it? Well, I didn't have a policy to start renting these things out. So, from the enforcement standpoint, um, I will point out, if you look at the temporary use for building a house, it makes it pretty clear it's temporary at the top that you've got one year. When you look at that recreational use, it doesn't say that. So you've got a permit in perpetuity for a use that's supposed to be limited to six months, and I don't know how you police that, absent having someone standing at the, at the gate every evening if you've got, have we got 350 permits out there? What'd you say, 35 a year? How, how many in one year have we issued? What's the one, number of? One year temporary use permits. Are recreational. Rec Rec recreational was 209 within since 2020 to today. 209, so 100 a year, right? Average, average about 100 a year? I, I, I don't know, I mean, I would say it, it, anywhere from probably 75 to 100. Okay, so let's just say 100 for the last 10 years. So we've got at least 1,000 of them out there that maybe think they're legal and probably that many more that don't care. Um, but let's stick with the ones that believe they're legal, that have a permit. Let's say that there's 1,000 of them out there or 800 of them. And they're supposed to be limited to using it for six months out of the year. How? Do you police that? How does the county police that? How is it even possible to police that? I mean, it sounds like we created a scenario, or someone did. I'm not saying we, because none of us were here when this started, okay? But someone created a scenario that can't be enforced. Unless somebody can think of a way that that could be done. I don't know how you would do it. Well, how would you limit them to using it for six months? I mean, in, in the past, the way we've dealt with it is that the, the you know, the, the recreational vehicle permits or violations that deal with those come in through property owners. Um, and they'll say... Complaints. Complaints. Um, you know, as I'll refer back to, 
you know, we have a, a Senate bill that was adopted and is now part of legislation that says that a person designated as a code inspector may not initiate an investigation of a potential violation of a duly enacted code or ordinance by the way of an anonymous complaint. The ordinance must provide his or her, the complaint must provide his or her name and address to the governing body as respected to the Board of County Commissioners before an investigation occurs. Okay, so that that just came into effect, but in years past, we would have anonymous complaints come by, and it would be like, you know, I live down the road, and I've seen Mr. Smith across the way. Um, I know that he's supposed to limit his occupancy to six months in a calendar year, um, but I see him there every day. So in years past, they've coordinated with electrical providers, you know, because they'll have electrical service, and they can verify the usage of the meter uh, and when it's been being used when you're developing that code case. Um, you know, a lot of times when you go by, it takes a little bit of investigation, but, you know, when you look at things and you see that every time I've been by this property or every time in this area, I've seen somebody there. Um, you know, the way the regulation currently exists is that occupancy cannot exceed six months of the calendar year. So when this was written, it wasn't the intent that that permit would expire. Um, well, that's where I was going with this. It's just a one-time fee. It's a one-time permit, and, and, you know, the requirement is that you get that permit, you put in your electrical service, you put in your well, you put in your septic, all of which is inspected, you know, so then you have a limitation that your occupancy can't exceed six months in a calendar year. If you're proven otherwise to be exceeding that, then you'd be in violation, you know, but at, at the end of the day, if it becomes a renewable permit, what are we renewing? You know, you're not going to follow that up with, you're not re-inspecting the septic, you're not re-inspecting the electrical unless that's been disconnected. Um, you know, so it just. So does the property appraiser, once it, they put it in, I realize they're only living there six months, but it's there 12 months. Yeah. And so property. is it taxed the, just like a mobile home or anything else as far as they property don't, taxes? They don't assess the, the, the vehicle because it's a transportable unit. It's basically a licensed road ready vehicle. Um, they do pick up the assessment values of the well and the septic, uh, power pole, those, those are picked up on the assessment. Uh, when they get the recreational vehicle permits, when they get the one-year temporary use permits, they pay the, the fire and solid waste assessments to the county. They pay the driveway permit applications, go through all of that. No. That's for the one-year permit? Either. Either one or? One-year or recreational permit, so they're paying the assessments. You know, I just, I go back to, and I guess it becomes a legal question, is if this was changed now, do you have to grandfather in everyone that we've existed before and we go from this point on if we're going to have an expiration of this permit? Because, you know, those people followed a different rule, you know. So if, if we end up with having to follow up every year, let's say we issue 75 to 100 every year. It's not a problem in year one to go check those, but year three, we're now checking 300 permits. Year five, we got 500 permits. So, you know, it just becomes a lack of staffing at that point in time to follow up on this type of stuff. Well, that's, that's the problem that exists today. Mr. Chair. It, it isn't a future problem, it's a problem today. Commissioner Lynn. Um, a couple things. One is I think we should ask the attorney to clean up the recreational vehicle language to have it more more clear I think uh, that's one thing that we should probably do to, to maybe make that recreational vehicle definition more uh, coherent with Florida statute Mr. Pravat yes, um, versus the different definitions that we may have I mean that's just this just my opinion and then secondly I think with what Mr. Meeks is saying I agree with him I think that on the complaint side now that that Senate bill passed where the complainant must file their name, you're going to get a lot less complaints. I mean, they may, the, the, land, the, the neighbor may not like it, but they don't, they're not going to like it enough to put their name to it to make their neighbor mad. To create a problem. Yeah, to create a problem with their neighbor, and now there's animosity between them two. So, you know, I think that what I would like to see the board do is, number one, in addition to cleaning up the definition is is prohibit commercial use of these you know no no airbnbs in recreational vehicles to to have tenants i mean they weren't designed to have i mean there, there's an avenue for that in my opinion which is on rv park um 
where you can create rental income in the proper format with the proper permits in an RV or campground versus having five campers on my property and having five different tenants four times a month. So eliminate the commercial use um, of those things on private property. And then secondly is there's no way to police the six month thing. There's just, I mean, we don't, I don't, I don't know of a solid way to police who's coming and going, how many times a year to determine, you know, those guys don't have the tools to do it nor the time. The complaint process just isn't going to work because the neighbors aren't going to want to, you know, cause rift amongst them. I would add in with that is that, you know, if you, if you start looking at other areas around us, I think our language may be better than what they have. Um, that, you know, uh, and Mac can even speak to this because he came here from Lafayette County, but Lafayette County's rules and regulations state that the occupancy can exceed 180 consecutive days, which means you move that RV for one day and then you put it back for another 180 consecutive days, which I think tries to encourage more of a violation. And that 180 consecutive days, specifically, some of that language comes out of the Code of Federal Regulations, which covers your floodplain ordinance in your environmentally sensitive areas, and that they're supposed to be limited to 180 consecutive days. Move it one day, then you put it back. But those RVs are supposed to remain road ready and tidal to, to go on the, on the. Ours, on the other hand, has a limitation of six months in the calendar year. Yeah. So it doesn't allow that one day of removal and they put it back. Well, here's my concern with the whole thing. This is why I wanted to look at it. Is the cost of housing is so high now? And now you, even though they're saying they're putting it there for six months, are they really living in it for 12 months, you know? And you got RV parks that are made for that kind of thing, you know? So if you want to live in a camper, do it at the RV park. Well, even with your, even if, even if your, your, your RV parks are kind of contradictory to statutes and that RVs are supposed to be used for temporary and seasonal occupants. So temporary and seasonal kind of my eyes would be six months. True. Um, you know, so a lot of times, and, and Mr. White, you remember some of the RV parks that would come before our zoning board under special exceptions that would kind of be put under there in that you don't encourage residential usage in your RV park, that you limit the occupancy in these RV parks the same way that recreational permits limit their occupancy to six months of a calendar year. Now, a lot of that burden goes on to the operators of those RV parks. But it's a situation that we go into that in that public meeting, putting it on the record, and that we're not creating situations where you have residential usage in RV parks. But you can make those changes in the LDR to the specific ones that we have been using as conditions. We keep repeating conditions, but you know we can go ahead and place those in there permanently. You know, Mr. Chairman, there are also. There, there is language within the LDRs that comes directly out of statute and building code that the inherent point of it that RVs totally do not meet permanent residential structure standards. And that's, I mean, there's already law set up for that. And expanding on what Mr. Beats was saying, you know, all, all rules that we have set in place, in my opinion, is top notch already. I mean, it is an issue, but everything comes down to is on the enforcement side. The Fed County has exactly what Mr. Meeks was speaking of, I personally attest to it. And actually, Hamilton County, in Hamilton County, the only thing they issue in Hamilton is an electrical permit. They don't require anything for a driveway, septic, fire and solid waste fees, anything like that. But the standards are already set up. I mean, there could be language tweak to a certain point about the RV section, but it's already state law, building code, and statute about permanent residential structure. Mr. Chairman. I got a question too. Go ahead. I, I guess where I was where I was going with that was is is I'd like to see the board, I mean if if you're busting this up into two groups, I think the group that's given us the least amount of problem are the applicants that are doing this te temporarily while they're either building a home or buying a mobile home. There's that group that are living, that are using these type of vehicles for an amount of time with intentions of a, of a home, some type of dwelling. There's this other group that it's a vacation, it's a cheaper form of housing, it's a income producer, it's a... 
Well, but you, you'd have to split those off as you hit it there, not to interrupt you. But I mean, so what about your vacation or like your weekend warriors that go down versus someone? Well, that, I mean, that this, it's theirs and they use it versus someone that rents it out. Well, here's what I don't like. I'm out riding the countryside and I see five and 10 acre lots scattered across the countryside with a well of septic and an RV that has a whole bunch of junk around it where there's a very low pride of ownership where they're they're living in it. They, they got a temporary use. It's a whole different deal there, yeah. They're living in it. Right. And, and, and those are the situations that I would like to see. I don't know how we do it legally. That's not my job. Um, those, those are the situations that I would like to see us try to clean up or get away from. Where, I mean, I think that under the temporary use thing, with the whole, you got to have a building permit, you got to have a septic. I mean, we're in, in a way that, this is just my opinion, that language is encouraging them to, be, to become somewhat permanent um, by getting the electrical and the septic there. What's the motivation to build a house or to buy a mobile home? And, and I understand some, everyone may not can afford that, but you know, to, I, I see it in my district everywhere. And I know that all of y'all do. Um, you know, it's just, there's a problem there. And I, I personally think it's two groups. I think there's, there's the group that are, have the good intentions and it truly is temporary while they're working on something better. And then maybe you do have some of the weekend warriors like you talked about that have good intentions and are, and are, and are do, trying to do it the right way too. But then there's this other group that may could go through this permitting process and as time gets away from it, it becomes worse. It, six months turned into, comes, homestead. comes in homestead. Right. And we don't have to build a house. We got a well and a septic, and we got a roof built over our camper, and we're just gonna live in it like this. And before you know it, they got a 25-year-old camper and a whole bunch of. And, and, and the reason why I say just what you're saying, I mean, if you go to Steen Hatchie, go down there. I mean, there's some $100,000 pole barns with three hundred thousand dollar RVs are it. Right. And they keep it nice. Right. They pay taxes and it looks that, that's what I'm just saying. Those I, are the I, good think intentions. I think there's three groups that, maybe three. Yeah, I think there's three groups there that is what I'm looking at. And Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind on that, I know on some of these motorhomes like these big buses and things that you buy, I'm just wondering how we would handle that here as far as any kind of way to impose a uh, like you say a homestead tax or something, because when you buy those things, they're a mortgage. That, I mean, the paperwork that comes to you and everything, it, it is a mortgage. That's how you, you pay mobile, it. Mobile mortgage. Huh? It, it, it truly <laughs> is. I mean, if you ever looked at the paperwork on them, those things are, it tells you, it meets all the criteria. Bathroom, kitchen, cooking. You literally can claim that on your taxes as a mortgage. I, I just don't know how that would affect. Well, I, it's just that the, the structural question doesn't meet your residential occupancy requirements. Gotcha. You know, requirements for residential uses, ingress, egress, windows, doors, and things like that, those, those structures don't meet. What about a renewable permit? Well, that was one thing that was that was discussed, but you know what I mean? Like I said, you've got the, the regulations, the way it's written now, and the way it's been handled for all these many years, is it's not set up to be a renewable permit. It's just a, a conditional permit that has a limitation in its occupancy. That, that's so, your problem. <laughs> You, right. you, 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 you got a temporary structure, but you've given it a permanent permit. Well, that's why the statute, I was about the statute says clearly it's temporary yeah. use, but you've given it a permanent permit. If it were like the one that's being used for temporary occupancy while you're building, it'd be different. And it'd certainly be easier to enforce then because you'd have that list that would come out when the permit's renewed. One thing we haven't talked about is authorization to store an RV. Because if if you've got an applicant saying, I'm only going to occupy it for six months, well, are we then authorizing as well storage for another six months? That's another question you haven't talked about because I'm assuming that the majority of these are being left behind. They're not moving them. Um, so that's just another question. Well, I'm a land use guy, so I ain't know much about telling people what they can and can't do on their own land. but. You get into this, it's just a whole different thing, and it's getting worse as I go around the county and look. It's just more and more, just like Commissioner Land said. And I was just wondering if you made it a renewable permit where they had to pay a fee every year, and it renewed just like 
just like house trader tags do it at uh, tax collector's office. You, you got to go get it, get the sticker, or you know you're in violation if you don't pay it. But then you're back to the enforcement. Enforcement, issue. yes, I get it. It's back to the, the enforcement issue in that um, all of the ones that we've issued prior to this day, they're going to remain. You're not going to get rid of those. You assume so. You assume so, but I mean, so, you, know, what, you know, you secure, I mean, you're in the, in the litigation business, you know what I mean? So yeah. when, when you're not taking the property right from me without compensating me for it. I mean, that's, Mr. that's law. But that's so, it. How, how do they, um, I guess that goes through Sharon's office, but how do they enforce the mobile home renewal that doesn't get renewed? Does someone go out and check that? or? Well, that, that goes under your mobile home tag renewal. That, that goes with a tag, but a, yeah. the permit itself, the mobile home, um, which we kind of have that deal now, but it's under a temporary use permit where you can do a five-year temporary use permit for a family member to place a mobile home. That's a renewable permit. Okay, um, but I think that's what you were insinuating. Yeah. But that that situation is that they they have that mobile home permit to renew. But you, we don't. I mean, we have some of those, but I mean, it's not an abundance of what we've kind of set up. Now that we have Robin, um, we we kind of set up a situation that we will get those reports generated as to when does this five-year temporary use permit come up for renewal. Mm -hmm. So you can notify the property owner, and sometimes. What we have now is that that, mobile, that temporary use permit no longer exists. That person has moved and that mobile home's been removed. So then that, that permit doesn't need to be renewed, it's gone away. Um, but, you know, with going back to the recreational vehicle side of things is that, I mean, we, we, we've had it for years, you know what I mean? It was at some point in time, you know, when they created the regulations, the county decided they were going to be in the recreational business. You know, had they never had the, the uh, process started you wouldn't you wouldn't have it okay but you know you, you're you're 30 years into something and if you change that requirement now you can change it from now going forward but you'll never get rid of the ones that you have but going back to the enforcement side of things is predominantly the recreational vehicles that are in violations are not people that are securing and obtaining permits it's you know i know enough about electrical to tap into an existing service or uh, give my neighbor 50 bucks a month for me to uh, run my gray cable across the ground and, and, and rob the electrical. Until that's found, until that's complained on, you don't know it. And then that's when Lynn finds that someone's dug a 55 gallon drum in the, in the ground and created their own drain field. You don't have those with legally permitted armies. Mm -hmm. They have such permits. And, you know, just, just following up with that is we have several of these people that. Um, they actually do build homes. I mean, it's very common for these people to go ahead and size their septic system for the home that they want to build or the mobile home that they're going to have in place while they're doing the recreational permit. And they may use that recreational permit for two or three years, and then all of a sudden, here comes the, the, the plans. Uh, you know, we, we were having this discussion internally with Mac and Robin earlier. Mac had just done a slab inspection on one of the permits that we have listed in front of them. So, I mean, we do have those people that are converting their recreational site to an actual residential site. Well, one of the other places also that we run into that's still a enforcement issue, um, gave the chairman one of the copies of our ag pole permit applications. And there is language in there that says strictly, basically, if you change this ag pole from anything else other than ag pretenses, you may be brought before a code court for it. And I can personally attest, I do see this all the time. But it's like me saying, I can't deny a permit because I think you're going to do an RV because when I come out to do your ag pole, I see the big covered area and picnic tables and this and that. It's like saying, I'm going to arrest you before you brought the back. But that, that's just another example of an enforcement issue where people are going to find a way to do it. Not doing it the correct way. But you're saying we can't just go look. It's got to be a complaint. Well, I think there's some gray areas that give us, you know, staff latitude. Uh, you know, certain things that Mac has privy to under the building code with people who manipulate electrical services and stuff, falling under health, safety, welfare issues. I think there are some exceptions in the statute under that Senate bill 
that specifically speak to that. If it is a health, safety, welfare issue, if it's a situation someone's modifying electrical services, that can certainly cause loss of life. Um, it becomes a health safety issue if somebody doesn't have an approved septic tank that they're just dumping raw sewage on the ground. That becomes an effect to public safety. Um, so I think there's some some gray areas and that you know gives us a little bit of latitude, but just you know saying we're going to take from this road to this road and go to everybody's property and see who's in violation today. I don't think that we can actually do that. Well, like you got this list here of all these permits. You know, my idea is just start going down line by line and checking them but but see that's one of the things that we started now that robin's here he's getting a report for these one-year temporary use permits he's getting a report on these five-year temporary use permits so when they start coming up from renewal um you know you can check because the way the one-year temporary use permit is issued is that you don't come to us to renew that that one-year temporary use permit states that uh, no, in no event shall the use continue more than 12 months without approval of the 40 county commission and the 40 county commission shall give such approval only upon finding of actual construction is continued. So I don't need to wait until 11 months before I come to the board and say, hey guys, I want you to extend my one year temporary use permit. I've been out here for 11 months and I haven't broke ground. Um, what, what that's for is that we run into hurricane season and now my construction's had to slow down or the way we are right now with availability of materials, it's gonna increase that time frame of construction. Which so I, I get that. To you and say, hey, I'm going to be done within three months, but I'm 80% done with my residence. That's certainly a reason this board can extend that temporary restriction. Well, I'm just wondering, were they guaranteed that residential permit, even though they don't have to renew it if you set new rules in place to where it has to be a renewable permit? Would it make all those past ones have to renew too? Could you make it where they could they'd have to renew too? Talking on the recreation. recreational is what I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a legal question. I don't know that you can retroact permits when someone obtains it under different regulations and guidelines. I don't think it's a different regulation if you establish the six month time frame. That's not a different regulation because it says six months today. What you never did though was say identify the six months and the permit. If you identified the six month time frame in the permit, it would still be six months. You haven't taken anything away from anyone. But you'd have to specify what six months, for example. And this is just an example, and I don't have a preference in any of this. But I'm looking at it from the standpoint of how do you enforce, okay? So if you're going to enforce and you're going to say six months, then identify the six months. Is it January through June? Is it July through? I mean, just figure out what six months. There's some people that come down here in the fall. They know what six months it is. There are others that just want to come in the summertime, and they know. So if you were to say, okay, these people that can only use these things for six months, we're going to require you to start identifying the six months. We're going to break the year up into two halves or whatever. Um, well, then you that, got, that would get you closer, well, at least. because Then, then you, you got the problem with the people down on the river. They only stay on and on the weekends. So if you do the weekends for the whole year, it's not six months. So Look, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to approach this thing very objectively and say, how are you going to enforce something without identifying, without identifying that six-month time frame? There's, there's got to be a cutoff because digital records that we have access to is limited. And it's not from the beginning issuance of recreational vehicle permits. So you can't pick and choose who you apply the regulation to. If, if I if, if I if I got my permit in 2018, it went under the same regulation guidelines as someone who obtained it in the year 2000. And that was under the same guidelines that was issued in 1995. Well, so we don't have access to those other records. I, I get we're not going to finish this today. I figured this is probably going to run into a whole lot more than what all of us ever intended. But that's why I wanted everybody to come together so we could start a conversation on it. I mean, people could start coming up with ideas, you know, well, what about this or what about that? You know, and have you guys, because you have to enforce it and you have to do the permits and we'd like to hear what you got to think. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Robin's in the field now. So, I mean, you got any questions of what he's seen since he started here? I would like to ask him that while he's right here before we have to start the what he's done. I mean, it, 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 it's really remarkable because he's, he's got a good rapport with people. 
He's got a good procedure in place. Uh, he, you know, has taken his regulations. He's kind of streamlined them for where he can do his notifications quicker. Um, you know what I mean? So it, it's typically there's a common thread. Most of the time when we got somebody who's occupying a recreational vehicle or have an issue with a recreational vehicle with no permits, typically care of premises falls along with that because they're going to have some junk, trash, debris along with there too. So there's usually a group of regulations that they're cited on every time we deal with it. So, um, but yeah, Robin, do you want to? Uh, hey, Robin. How are you, sir? Good. Uh, what kind of what kind of things are you seeing out there when you go if somebody issues a complaint or on the, on these temporary is it somebody issuing a complaint is the reason you went out there or what what's going on there typically it's a complaint that's we, we get a complaint in the office and that triggers the office for, for me to go out and actually look to do an inspection and like ron said there's typically a pattern you know uh, the folks like you mentioned the weekend warrior they're good folks. Yeah. They're paying their taxes. They're bringing economy to the to the county. We want that. Uh, but the habitual, whether it's an RV or a shed, they're going to do it regardless. Uh, what I can tell you is that we really haven't had enforcement in the county over the last 10 years. Um, what I would ask for is just a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. um, let me go out there and do my job. Um, and I think that in the next three to six months, I think you're going to see a big difference. It takes time to build those cases. So, um, but when you find the case and the person is not doing what they should be doing, um, we'll take them to the, to the legal process and, and we'll, we'll make sure that they're either going to come into compliance or we're going to have them you know, be removed um, through the process. Um, but I would ask that you guys give me the time. You know, I know, uh, Mr. White, I've worked with you on a few cases. Um, some of them are real tough. They're just they're complicated yeah. um, it's been going on for so long and uh, but you got to give me the time to get out there it, it is happening um, and, I, and I, I can assure that we're doing it with, with, with really um, soft hands uh, because these are this is our community um, and in some cases mr. Harris they're, they're in real bad shape financially um, we don't want to just put them right out so we want to really get it solved and I would just ask for time um, and, and I'll say on that, he, you've helped me already with a similar situation. Ronald, you know, we had that one issue out there on 139th. I mean, that went on forever. And, uh, and unfo it was an unfortunate deal. The guy's house burned down. He went beyond the time. Um, and, and there were some other issues, like you say, trash, things like that. just got out of the way. Um, had to go before the magistrate court and had to get it handled. But it's just... I think there's three. I think you, you said two a while ago, but I think there's actually three. Like you said, the weekend board thing. But I do believe if we come up with some better language and some better ways, maybe a, a permit like you're saying, things like that. Well, but but I, you'll probably find what you all, I think, are saying uh, is the guys that are not following the rules are the ones that never probably came didn't to get you a in the first time. To start with. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Group. Yeah, and honestly, and not I know it's another sore subject, but. We do. Uh, I've seen the bad-looking mobile homes, the RVs that are falling down, but we got mobile homes out there that look worse than that that people are living in. I mean, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But you know, like I said, maybe hard times. That's, that's all they can afford. I don't know. Well, I, I hate to not break it up. We got a commission. I mean, uh, yes, here and we got to get to here. So, and just closing that, I would just like to ask you guys, you know, for some recommendations on what what you think or some way to curb some of this or I don't know just give me what you think well I mean I think you know one thing Mr. Pavad brought up in, in clarifying our language of travel of rec recreational vehicles come up with a general term that it's the same consistently through both permits um, I think it's a, a, at least a good start on it um, you know, uh, some of the other stuff, I guess we could probably research if there's some other legal ramifications that we could do and include. Well, I'd like to know what the renewable permit would look like. Just, we, I'm not saying we got to do it. I'd just like to know, is that going to take more people to do it, you know, to check on it? Does that have to go through the tax collector's office to do that? I mean, how do we handle it? What does it look like? Well, the... Uh, the, the permit itself, you know, would probably be handled internally as far as creating a time frame of uh, if, we, if we get a calendar year of 12 months 
and those recreational permits that are issued within the calendar year of uh, you know 2022 or whether we make it mimic our fiscal year which would be october however we, we structure that um you know i think that you know we can probably get with mr kraus which is uh he creates our, our building permit system so that we can run annual reports uh based on those recreational permits that were issued in that year um, and then if, if we choose to go down that road of, of issuing a, a, a renewal, um, you know, we have to do that with some type of notification up front so that person knows that, you know, they will have to renew that permit. Um, I guess then we have to figure it up, are we going to follow it, are we going to make it just a paperwork kind of thing, or are we going to actually go out and do an inspection to make sure that they have not modified anything from the previous file, you know what I mean? Well, so that's where I was going with a renewable permit because at that point, if they don't pay, Absolutely. then you got you got a reason to go out there. Yeah. So if they use a, a conventional recreational permit and now we go out there for them to renew it and now they come off that. Got two, or three, got RVs. two or three RVs. Then that would initiate some, you know, a violation of, of that original permit. That's kind of what the way I was leaning that way. So it gives you a, a reason at that point to be out there. And then if they got two or three, or if they got the buried 55 gallon drum or whatever, you know, you can see it at that point. You I have just, a reason to be there. I just feel like if we go that route, it would have to be from that point forward. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much we can do with things from the past. Mr. Mr. Chairman, with, with that being said, I'm at, I think those these guys are doing a fantastic job. Robin hit the ground running, and sure it's did. helped me too, and 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 jump right on some bad cases. But under tab two, under Mr. Pravat's uh, four items there, number four, should should we should we consider? I mean, we just put the world on notice that 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 we're looking to make some changes here. Should we put a 90-day moratorium on this until we till we get it right? I mean, I don't want those guys to have a blitz of guys coming down here looking for these RV permits. You can deal with this tomorrow. Would that be, yeah, but we've asked them for recommendations. They got time to. I, I had one thing, Mr. Chairman, I know real quick. Um, you know, we had language in LDRs for mental health. Everything Mr. Meeks was saying will help. Everything Mr. Preston was saying will help. Just a quick suggestion. This is totally on the all in the the board, one way or the other. My opinion is beside the fact. With all these things comes more enforcement, even with the renewable department, which is a great idea. Um, word has got out, and I don't know if it was you, Mr. Chairman, or who it was about Town Brentford spitballing what I did. The way we always did it when I was in Fed County, the town of Mayo, I was their permitting agency and I was their code enforcement officer as well. They paid X amount of percentage of my salary. Maybe if there's a way this board could do some type of interlocal with the town of Brantford, pay X amount for another enforcement officer under Mr. Crespo, cover those fees and possibly fees for another vehicle to be out in the field. Then you've got two enforcers out there taking care of it, taking care of claims, checking on the new departments. Let's say it's just, just an idea. Well, the town of Brantford's come to me wanting, wanting to get Mr. Robin there to do theirs, but I said, look, I don't know how much time he's got. He's, he's a pretty busy guy right now because it's been so long, it's, you know, Ron didn't have time to do a lot of it. I mean, they were watching our one day a week. Full of one that most also, of the time. Try to isolate Wednesdays to deal with code enforcement stuff, and then. So it's we're behind we're behind the curve on it. I get it, and I, do I think a second guy's a bad idea? Absolutely not. Especially if you know we could share them. I don't know if the town of Live Oak has one or not, but if it's if it's if it's another individual or is uh, Robin had a good idea, uh, you want to? Yeah, I, actually, if I could make a suggestion, sir. Go ahead. Um, Probably the best scenario to have some sort of a tech inside of the office because I'm dedicating almost two and a half, three days building the case and the legal framework that's necessary in order to prosecute. Having another person in the field is not what's going to help me. Uh, I would rather build the back office so that at the end of the day, I can hand you a template where you can hire anybody because I built you a McDonald's system. So by me being the, the front of it, it will give a better system in the back 
So if we're considering increasing a budget, it would also be cheaper just to hire a tech versus paying for a vehicle and another salary. If I get a really good tech on the inside of the office, I can do three times the amount of inspections, control that process, especially the community engagement portion of it, and then be able to refine that and then bring back something that is scalable. If you give me another tech right, if you give me an officer right now, you've got someone that's just going to flop around and I haven't developed the full process yet. Um, and it would really jam us up and really set us back. So if you let me you just that need that front, time I got the build. Yeah, Mr. But Chairman. If, we, if you can give me the help in the back office, I think we could take on Brantford as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to add what he's saying. I've heard, uh, I don't know him personally, but I've heard great comments about him. And a lot of times, it's about the demeanor of the person that handles these. You can get a bad apple out there and cause way more problems. Oh, so yeah. I, I appreciate what he's doing with the people. And even when you got a bad situation, he's able, he has the personality to handle that. So no I would absolutely be in support of him trying to kind of be the face and, and having some help. Because I think he's very, very few, they're hard to come by, someone like him with it's a that tough, can, that can help. To have, yeah. I agree, he's done a fantastic job, and I appreciate the help you get done for me. Yep. Well, I've told you, I don't know how many times already, so. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But uh, I, I got to wrap it up, guys. Okay. I, I mean, I could go on for a while on this, but just look at it. You know, look, re I'd really like to look at the renewable permit thing. That way we got an avenue of doing something different. Whether we go backwards from here forward, I don't know. That's a legal question I guess we'll have to deal with. But that's kind of what I'd like to see. I mean, I need to know what it's, is it going to cost us more than it's worth or is it worth the extra that we're going to have to cough up as taxpayers to police it? I don't know. And I'm talking about the renewable permits is what I'm talking about. So. If y'all would just study on that a little bit, and we'll, we'll come back around to it. But at the time being, uh, the moratorium, do we want to address that now, or do y'all want to wait for a regular meeting? You can't do that until a to regular a, board meeting. That's right, tomorrow. to yeah. a board meeting. But yeah. I guess we'll, we'll discuss that we, tomorrow. We can now. add that on tomorrow. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll close this. Uh, do you have to have a motion? Thank all three of you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you, Robin. Robin. Appreciate all Thank that. Thank you for Yeah. yeah. Um, with that, I just need a motion to adjourn. So motion to adjourn. Motion by Commissioner Land, second by Commissioner Fleming. Yeah. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank you.